here. Sometimes when Alex goes out, Alex comes back in the house with dirty shoes like these. Ooh. Yeah. But you guys don't do that, right? Yeah. No? Or you do? You don't? You don't come back in with dirty shoes? Yes. What's on this shoe? Dirt? Sand? So we had went camping once, and it just so happened that where we went camping, they had a lot of sand there. And this is the result of what happened when Alex decided to go and clean the sand. He got the sand all over his shoes. So do you think there's any way for him to come home and say, hey, I didn't go and play with sand when he came in with these shoes. Can he say that? That would be an obvious lie, right? There's no way he can come into the house and say, hey, I wasn't playing with sand, right? So it's the same way when we do something that's considered a sin. <coughs> We might not, to us, we might, might not be able to visually see that um, in another person that we've actually um, done something that's not acceptable. But guess who knows? Guess who knows when we commit a sin? Who was that? God. And it's clear to him, just as how it's clear to you that Alex was playing in sand, clear to him when we have sinned. And so, when you have a dirty sh <coughs> What was that? So, what are some ways in which you can clean these boots? Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. 
one. It's a bright, sunny day, one of the first warm days of summer. The more joy in this room. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. That sounds good. Okay, it's that time. Offering time. And I have something to share with you guys. I don't like spending my money. And I can't be the only one in here who's like spending money. And for me, I create my budget. Laura and I recently got married. So, okay, we need to make a budget. We need to make sure every, you know, where everything is going, how the money is being spent. And I obsess over it. I worry about it. Sometimes it sincerely gets in the way of me trusting God. And a verse that I like to think of is Matthew 6, 26. And there, God says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? So a bird, God is looking out for the birds in the sky and store the feeds for them. That's how much he's looking out for me. I can budget all I want, I can plan how I'm going to spend my money and where it's going to go, but God always has my back. And one thing that I've been pretty adamant about is making sure that I pay my tithe and offering. And what that has shown me is that when I give that money, that money I can spend, that money I know where it would go, I know what I would save it for, I know how I would use it, when I give it to God, He's always shown me that He will reward and He will always provide my needs. So as we prepare for offering, I challenge you all, whatever your financial situation is or your relationship with God is, that you trust Him, that you believe that He will supply your needs, and this is just giving back the money that is His. I'll invite those to collect the offering. Also came and said, Master, Master, open up for us. Mm -hmm. Peter replied, I assure you, 
I do not know you. Therefore, be alert, because you don't know either the day or the hour. Father God, 
thank you for this opportunity, Lord. The people are before you, Lord. Here I am, your speaker, Lord, today before you. I pray that you would get me out of the way and that you would speak what you have to be spoken today from me, Lord. Uh, might there be something that we take away from this summer that causes us to respond to your person, God, uh, not merely as religious subjects, but truly an intimate relationship with you might we move forward. Be with us, Lord, ready each mind and heart here today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, typically when I speak, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to talk about far in advance. Uh, usually there's something that's been pressing on my heart, or eating away at my spirit, so much so that I need to talk about that particular topic. But lately, the honest truth is that I've felt somewhat disconnected from God, honestly. And it's subtle, but when I really evaluate how I feel, it's true. I pray to Him. I, I still read the Word each day, uh, even if it's not for an extended amount of time like I would like. Uh, I've made a pretty consistent habit even of on the Sabbath setting down my phone or iPad or computer to disconnect from the world and uh, picking up physical books, Bible and other devotional books to try and just relax my mind. And I enjoy my job. I work remotely, what's not to love. Uh, I edit and design books for authors. And uh, I studied English in college, so it's right in line with what I enjoy. I have a healthy and budding marriage with my wife, Megan. I have intimate relationships with all of my family. I'm even exercising more now than years, uh, half a decade to be exact. And uh, following the prophet Ellen White's counsel on intermediate fasting and dieting. So physically I'm in a pretty healthy place, I would say. But if you ask me how I felt, like really felt, deep down inside, I'd say I feel a longing. As though I'm stuck in the continuous spin cycle of daily tasks and chores. I'd say it's hard to be a man and to truly live a principled and virtuous life. It's challenging. I'd say it's hard to keep watchful and instant in my faith when the news continually tells the world that is in perpetual turmoil. Sometimes I think about, in those moments when I think about the state of the world, how I could encourage other people to say, with some core doctrine from scripture, one-on-one, -on -one, maybe some, someone saying something that they're very pessimistic about the state of the world. And uh, I think of telling them something that I think might surely bring them peace, but then I have to ask myself, is that even bringing me peace right now? Overall, though, I would say I'm in a pretty good place in my life by most standards, and that I typically, uh, I typically now, I would say, have an answer for most things that challenge me spiritually or intellectually uh, by searching out answers in Scripture or looking up something online to try and gauge what I was thinking. But in the midst of feeling disconnected from God and doubting sometimes whether or not God is really going to come through on His promises and return to take me home, I have to honestly wonder if on occasions my curiosity for the knowledge of God is truly a desire to know Him more intimately or if it's a defense mechanism I put in place to keep me from my worst fear, the fear of not being known. I don't know if this might apply to any of you here today, if any of the things I've mentioned might be lining up with some of your thinking. I'm going to repeat uh, that previous line. I have to wonder if on occasions our curiosity for the knowledge of God is truly a desire to know Him more intimately, or if it's a defense mechanism we've put in place to keep us from our worst fear, the fear of not being known. Today, we will learn about, we will learn to be, that to be known is to rest in Jesus and to be a fear, in fear of not being known, 
is to be self-reliant. To be known. You know, something I have observed, whether watching YouTube videos, scholarly, theological debates, or just from everyday conversation, is that even skeptics like atheists and agnostics, who do not believe in a god, want to argue for their place in this world. They want their lives to have meaning. I've also noticed that regardless of culture or upbringing, throughout time, from what we've observed, when we perish, we weep, we're sad, we struggle to let go. Regardless of our belief system, the innate, desperate, often unspeakable longing of each human is to be known. We want to belong. We do not want to be forgotten. We long for fame and to build a legacy, but even if we would attain those things, people would eventually forget us or misremember our legacy long after we would pass. What is the point of all our working, corporate ladder climbing, time spent on hobbies and forming memories with families and friends and even bringing children into this world? To be known. Everyone wants a title, an identity, a stake in this world, but without God, all is fleeting. You see, if God does not exist, we cannot be truly known. Without God, no other one human being, as we know, can grasp our every thought nor acquaint themselves with our every desire. Even our fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, husbands and wives, our closest friends, as much as they might know us and share experiences with us, they cannot know everything about us. This is why there is an obsession in science and science fiction to discover consciousness. Maybe you've heard of shows like Westworld or Altered Carbon on Netflix, all about humans becoming God, becoming eternal, able to preserve our every thought and longing. Society is trending in this direction. But if there is one sobering thought that counters uh, that move toward eternity, gaining eternity on our own, it's that in our natural universe, all people and places eventually perish. Our very universe is an isolated system, meaning that if we take the laws of physics and our universe at face value, the slow, gradual death of everything in the universe is our ultimate end. But mankind wants to live forever when science tells him he cannot. Why? I've heard it said that an alcoholic or the alcoholic who stumbles into the bar for another drink goes there because he longs for God. The sorrow that drives him, which he tries to alleviate with a bottle, is an aching that the bottle cannot soothe. He looks for something permanent. We're all chasing the same person, whether we want to or not. We're tunneling toward the heartbeat of the universe. I mentioned earlier that I felt somewhat of a disconnect from God, despite doing good things or living a quote-unquote successful life. But I, too, am longing for something permanent. Whether or not we will actually find what we're longing for depends upon if we are self-reliant or reliant upon God. Let us turn to Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, the parable of the ten virgins. Is everyone there? Yeah. Okay. I'll begin to read from verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. 
They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, We cannot, else there will not be enough for us and for you. But rather go to them, go to them to sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. It's quite a passage. Is there something peculiar that stands out to you in this text? Isn't there a certain character missing from this scene, this wedding ceremony? would appear to be the bride. First, we notice immediately that there are ten virgins. Five wives who take oil in their vessels with their lamps, and five foolish who take no oil in their lamps. The oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. The grace which only Christ can give is abiding presence, which is the seal of God. The five wise virgins who take oil in their vessels represent those who rely upon Jesus, which is to say, they have the faith in Jesus and they cling to his commandments. The five foolish virgins did bring their lamps with them and had enough oil for their lamps initially, but the bridegroom tarried and they 